Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Rick Games Vidicom video, we have yet further tech news which has, of course, popped up over the past 24 or so hours. Do feel free to check out the other video for today, which is linked in the video description, which, amongst other things, goes into the benchmarks of the 8700K, which, of course, is linked to the internet. Today, we're going to be discussing further information on Vega 11 as the graphics cards pass final verification stages of production, AMD releasing Crossfire drivers for the RX Vega graphics cards, an update to the Tesla and AMD deal, in other words they may not be one at all according to Global Foundries, and finally memory manufacturers are preparing for DDR5 memory to be released and in fact it appears that we're going to be seeing it uh, hit the shelves of retailers in 2019. But first things first, a grand total of 13, that's right, one three different graphics cards based on Vega 11 have passed certification in RRA, which is the South Korean National Radio Research Agency. Essentially, this is just to say that, hey, these products do not put out any dangerous interference with other electronics products, that they don't burst into flames when they're switched on, that type of thing. Now this website is actually quite handy, the RRA's official website, because you can actually publicly search through the database. As I just mentioned, there are 13 different graphics cards which appear to have passed a certification, and you might say, well, why the hell are there 13 of these damn things? I mean, that's an awful lot. Are we going to be seeing multiple derivatives as in like different clock frequencies? Are there going to be certain number of compute units disabled? Like how, how the hell is there 13 of them? Well, that's because at least according to leaks and rumors, some of these are also, of course, scheduled for notebooks and low powered devices. So Vega 11 will indeed be on desktop and also for lower power devices as well. Obviously, this appearing online doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be seeing the cards this year, but at least according to AMD's past history, particularly with Vega, there's generally about a month's delay between the appearance of this on the RRA website, I don't know why I'm having such difficulty saying that, and the official release of the GPU. So hopefully within the next month to six weeks, we'll start seeing them trickling on to store shelves, at least according to to hopes and theories, after all, there could be manufacturing issues. There's not an awful lot known about the specifications of these GPUs. They are essentially a replacement for Polaris 10 from the rumours, and there are some who are saying that the uh, GPUs are going to have just one stack of HBM2, which of course, of course means 1024-bit memory interface, 4 gigabytes of memory. Depending on the application and how well high bandwidth cache controllers actually work, it could be enough. Um, the only issue I have with it, of course, is if you look at the amount of RAM that, let's say, the GTX uh, 1060 has, most people are opting naturally for the 6GB model because, quite frankly, I don't think the 3GB model is worth it. I do feel that AMD could have a slight issue when it comes to actually promoting the cards, especially in the eyes of the layman. But once again, you have to remember some of these models are actually aimed at, you know, laptops and so on, where HBM2 memory is definitely a positive. Um, in terms of specifications, well, we don't actually know. There are some who are predicting it's going to have 2048 GCNs, which naturally is around the number it would really need as a minimum to really make it a worthwhile upgrade for users who have, let's say, an RX... 570, let alone a 580, but there's a good chance that performance won't be exactly be skyrocketing over the older generation. Thanks to stream processors only, it's probably also going to be a mixture of that plus the clock speeds of the GPUs. Speaking of clock speeds, and this is something I actually forgot to mention uh, with the intro of the video, uh, tomshardware.co.uk slash com has managed to get hold of... Um, whole list of AIBs and when they are going to be working on custom versions of Vega. So this is essentially a follow-up to what I said about the other day. Um, I'm going to read out a brief synopsis. I do encourage you to check out the article yourself. According to Tom's, 
XFX and Sapphire confirm that they are working on custom versions of the card, but they could not say when they're ready. Power, co uh, Power Color excuse me, have said they will be working on the cards as well, with mass production starting in November, but they don't have a small component that could actually be kind of handy, and that's DRAM. Well, that doesn't really matter. I'm sure they can make do without that. AMD have also partnerships, of course, with Asus, Gigabyte, and MSI, but... They don't have an exclusive deal with AMD. So in other words, they of course are free to uh, work with NVIDIA, which they are very happy to do. Um, Asus is already on board with the company, and they have confirmed in August that they would be releasing a ROX Strix card, and they said that they are still on the way, but they're pushing back the release until early October. Gigabyte have said that they will be producing a custom Vega card, but they don't know 100% certain if they will. So they would like to, they're going to try to, but they can't give you an actual certain date. Let alone the fact that they will certainly be doing it. MSI's response was perhaps most surprising of all. Because as you know, a lot of the time MSI, along with other manufacturers, heavily re-engineer the card. So in other words, they don't just have a reference design with a different cooler, they actually customise the PCB itself. Now, I'm going to read this verbatim. Uh, this is what a spokesperson of MSI said, although they were not named. We MSI won't be making a custom card anytime soon, uh, and they said that there's no additional information they would be willing to give. However, according to Tom's, and once again, I can't verify this myself, although I certainly wouldn't be surprised, AIB partners are unable to figure out a stable overclock to GPU frequency for all of the cards. In other words... They can't, let's say, um, have written the box that this card will be overclocked to 1733 megahertz or whatever speed and be confident. And so they can't therefore provide a warranty, guarantees or anything else because um, there's going to be a lot of different uh, temperatures of the card and what, I am, what AMD are reporting, what you know the average customer is reporting. And this is probably not helped as well by the whole package substrate issue that we've discussed at length before and the fact that the actual uh, um, Vega GPU core itself has different packages available and therefore they are slightly different heights which makes well, producing the actual coolers for them a pain in the ass. So this is an update to the whole Tesla slash AMD thing. According to Reuters slash Global Foundries, Global Foundries, of course, are the uh, company who fabricate the actual chips for AMD slash advanced micro devices. On the first day, they've said that Tesla are not committed to working with any um, chip manufacturer for self-driving slash autonomous driving technologies. And this, of course, contradicts reports from CNBC and other uh, websites, of course, immediately jumped on that because CNBC have a fairly good track record and they said that they were citing sources familiar with the matter that uh, Tesla had uh, been working with AMD to develop a chip designed to power artificial intelligence for self-driving cars. Now, this chip, we can make a presumption anyway, would be at least based upon a Navi. So the report uh, said that Global Foundry's chief executive, Sanjay Jha, was working directly with Tesla as well. However, a spokesperson said in an email Thursday, so of course that was yesterday, that uh, Tesla has not committed to working with us on any autonomous driving product or technology. And this was according, once again, to a spokesperson over at uh, Global Foundries. And they have then also said that JAR's comments um, at the Global Foundries Technology Conference were, quote, not reported accurately. So, um, whether this is happening or not, I have absolutely no idea. It's possible that Global Foundries are not involved in the manufacturing. It's possible that people especially Tesla, are pissed off about this and therefore they're trying to minimise this and basically hold it on the down low, or it's possible that it was just misreported in the first place. Which one's accurate? I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. Next one, and that is the Crimson 17.9.2 drivers. This adds multi-GPU uh, support for RX Vega. So this means that you can have up to two GPUs running simultaneously in the same system. How much performance addition do you get? Well, it does of course depend on the game and, well, resolution slash other bits and pieces, but it looks like you're getting up to 80% scaling. 
The only issue with this, and this of course is down to you, is the power consumption would be pretty damn high. Obviously, that may not be effective for you if you don't really care about electricity costs, or if uh, heat isn't that big of a deal, especially if you're going to be custom cooling your cards, but some, the idea of having two Vega 64s in particular might be a bit much, but I suspect for many, Vega 56 in Crossfire, especially if the performance for the drivers increases just a little more, it could be ideal. To be honest, however, and this is my opinion, multi-GPUs for the average user are not ideal, and quite frankly, if you're thinking of doing this, I would much rather the average person, not all, but the average person go with a GTX 1080 Ti or, you know, a very high-end solution um, and just kind of stick with one card. But I do understand some people, of course, want the absolute highest resolution, highest frame rates possible, or maybe you just want to plonk down by one card now and then one card in three or four months' time. If, for example, you've upgraded your display, let's say for the sake of argument, you've got a 1440p screen now, three months later you're like, okay, you know what, I've got a good deal on a 4K, okay, I don't have the performance for this, do I? And then you decide to plunk down the cash, of course, for a second GPU. And that's really why a lot of people go multi-GPU. Not everyone, but a good potential number. Now, final piece of news, and this one's a good piece of news, but, you know, eh, it's just something else for you to buy, and that is Rambus have a DDR5 memory working in its labs, and supposedly it will be ready for market in 2019. As we all know, DDR4 is currently the standard, and it, at least according to Rambus slash the industry is large, we're going to be seeing about twice the bandwidth slash density compared to the current generation of DDR4. We're also going to be seeing improved channel efficiency. Now, JDEC, who are, of course, responsible for the um, overview of the DDR, DDR specifications, excuse me, that the base frequency... For this should be about 20, sorry, about 4800 megahertz, which is double that of DDR4's 2400 megahertz. That is quite ridiculous. Now, there are fast memory kits available for DDR4, and we all know that we can even get like 4000 megahertz plus kits. You can get 4600 megahertz. I can't remember if you can get faster than that. But with all of that said, this means that you could have data rates of like 51.2 gigabytes per second, which is absolutely crazy. That's around, once again, twice that of DDR4. And we're going to see 64-bit uh, links down to just 1.1, um, which is uh, volts, that is. So, in theory, this could be absolutely fantastic. And according to the Rambus vice president, uh, he said, to the best of our knowledge, we are the first to have functional DDR5 DIMM chipsets in the lab. We're expecting production in 2019, and we want to be the first to the market to help partners bring up the new technology. On the time still ahead, however, he said that it's just a couple of quarters, not a couple of years. Everyone wants a faster memory pipe, end quote. Don't forget, DDR4, it's fast, without a question, but... As we all know, there's a couple of issues. Like, if you go quad-channel, your memory bandwidth obviously goes through the roof, but the issue is it takes more board space, it requires a lot more traces on the motherboard itself, power consumption goes up, plus as well, it can cost more. Like, quad-channel memory kits just are more expensive. Dual-channel memory is great, but, of course, when we're dealing with processor cores going up through the wazoo at the moment, like... It wasn't too long ago that four cores, eight threads were pretty standard, but Intel are now pushing six cores this year. We should see the introduction of eight cores from Intel. Goodness knows how many AMD are going with. I wouldn't be surprised if we hear like a 256 core processor from AMD next year. Of course, I'm not being serious, but, you know, all the manufacturers are just going nuts and just naturally we need more memory bandwidth for more cores, especially if they're running at higher clock speeds with uh, applications as well becoming increasingly multi-threaded. As you can imagine, that simply means that we need more memory bandwidth. So it's just the natural progression of things. Hopefully, however, you don't need to sell body parts to pay for this because, as we all know, memory prices are going up, unfortunately. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.